Thanks to everybody for joining. We're super lucky to have Dr. Don Booth, who has spent many years doing therapeutic drug monitoring. And uh, with the series this year, I wanted to come up with some topics that things we do as pharmacologists and, and getting some insight from some of the, the biggest and best, if you will. And so really excited to have you weigh in, Don, and, and share your experiences within the field. Now you should see a single slide, right? With a moving tiger. With a moving tiger. That's right, my walking tiger. Um, so I'm just going to acknowledge you guys that Tom here is here as well, Tom Juker. And it's been great working so closely with the neurologist because largely a lot of the monitoring we do is with anticonvulsants. But Claire has also been great because the other um, aspect of monitoring that we do is with immune modulatory drugs. But you'll see that this is heavily um, biased towards anticonvulsants just because we've learned more with anticonvulsants. I am going to tell you, and I'm going to, I love the way that Claire introduce this. Um, yep, I have a whole bunch of experience um, and I've learned so much and will continue to learn. I'm no longer, I've actually retired from Auburn University. I still do work with the group, but Dr. Tungrat um, and, uh, is now directing the lab and Dr. Juker works with her as well. And we're actually continuing to manipulate this data and work with this data. But I thought you might be interested in seeing what kind of monitoring we've been doing across time. And 2003 is when I moved to Auburn. And that's when we we were able to really pick up um, the ability to actually expand nas nationally. We couldn't do that while I was at a and And so you can see bromide, levetiracetam, which we refer to Kepra, I'm sorry, phenobarbital and zanisamide are our major anticonvulsants. And you can see that we are having a continual steady increase, and this just goes up to 2020. Um, so we have learned a whole bunch, but here's where I'm really going with this. I'm going to show you some of the things that we've done. And yeah, we'll talk about stuff for boards and examinations. But what I'm really hopeful of is that you guys can see the kind of data that we're collecting, because this is a veritable wealth of information. And I would like to generate some ideas in you guys, you being the younger generation, about how this data might be used. So having said that, and let me see if I can advance my slides because they're not going. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the basic principles. I know you know a lot of this, but how I see things. Um, we will talk a little bit about the pitfalls, the indications. I'm going to focus a lot on um, what the therapeutic range means, which really should more appropriately be therapeutic reference interval. We're going to talk about, remind you about half-life dosing interval and how that influences not only when we collect samples, but how we guide our practitioners in responding to whether it's therapeutic failure because of continuing seizures or therapeutic failure because of adversity. Um, and whether or not we need... I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll get that going. Remind everybody to mute their um, their speakers. Yes. So I don't can get confused and I do easily get confused. And then we'll talk about um, monitoring also with um, loading versus baseline. And I do have a number of cases that we'll look at. I'm not going to be able to look at all of them, um, but I'm going to try and highlight some of my points. But I left them in here so that you guys could potentially look at those cases and maybe follow up with questions afterwards. Um, by the way, I am going to apologize for my clocks in advance. I forgot to turn them off. Okay, what it is. So just like many tools that we have to support therapeutic decision-making, therapeutic drug monitoring is a, is a guide for dose, for, for a tool for guiding the dose and regimen. Presumably it removes the trial and error approach that we largely take when we're trying to make our patient respond better, whether it's the clinical response we want or to avoiding an adverse uh, reaction. Traditionally, we've kind of asked the question, is our, pair, our patient within the therapeutic range? But you know, that is way too simple simplistic. Uh, and we're going to see that as we go through. And of course, sometimes what we're really interested in is my patient subtherapeutic, or is my patient above the maximum and presumed toxic as well. And so the question that you're trying to answer is largely going to also, um, I guess, cause differences in how you actually use this tool. And the criteria upon whether or not you use it depends upon your patient, but also depends upon the drug and, of course, the assay as well. Above all else, it does assume a dose-response relationship between uh, the concentration that you're going to presumably measure um, and the patient itself. And so what we're after here is kind of the Goldilocks approach. What we're trying to do is make sure that our dose is just right for our patient, which largely is going to come back 
back and cause us to re-examine what we mean by therapeutic range. Now, the why is exemplified here, and this is relatively old data, but I simply took the time that the sample was collected. I took the dose that the patient was on, the concentration that we achieved with that patient. And you can see that the variability in dose versus concentration is all over the board. And those drugs with a short half-life, especially levetiracetam, this will this variability, of course, also reflects differences in sampling time. But for those drugs with a long half-life, sinicimide, phenobarbital, and bromide, that variability there uh, reflects variability in the patient. So if we look at any single dose and we look at the variability at that dose, this is going to be patient variability because presumably these patients are at steady state and the timing of sample collection should not really make a difference in these concentrations uh, for those particular drugs. So who? So this is actually coming from the literature. Um, I'm gonna add my biases as we go forward. But traditionally we thought about monitoring being critically important if we have a life or organ threatening disease. And I think that works. If we don't have to worry about our patient dying from something, then it doesn't make sense to cause our clients to spend lots of money um, on it. Uh, so certainly seizures are life-threatening, immune uh, suppression, the need for immune suppression. So um, failure in our immune system, whether it's too much or too little, is another example of life-threatening diseases. And so it makes perfect sense that those two groups of drugs, anti-seizure meds and immune modulators, be part of our uh, target for therapeutic drug monitoring. I've got one or two antibiotic uh, cases as well. Certainly therapeutic failure to antibiotics is critically important. And for aminoglycosides, toxicity is important. One of the biggest problems, of course, with antibiotics is that we can't get our data back in a timely fashion. And I'll mention that here again in just a couple minutes. So poor clinical indicators, again, immune modulators and anticonvulsants or anti-seizure meds, where we don't want to rely on therapeutic failure or toxicity is up oh, we need to alter our dose and regimen. Um, in the presence of disease, um, in the presence of drug interactions, these are all situations where if we've met the first two criteria, it becomes important to potentially proactively reassess our patient's dose. And then what we don't have a real good handle on are physiologic factors, but this is something that will grow hopefully across time in veterinary medicine, is something that we presumably could look at our database with and find out what physiological factors are playing a major role in the response between concentration and dose. So again, things to look for in the future. So let me, I'm going to move you guys right now. I can't see my slides because I've got you guys there. Okay, so um, the other thing, of course, is we have a whole host of different patients from shrew to elephant, and uh, we have been had the luxury of being able to monitor all sorts of weird species, and that's been a lot of fun as well to help with therapeutic decision making. The problem with, of course, our um, peak glycoprotein deficient or MDR1 deficient animals is that we don't really have a good way to predict concentrations and response, although I will show you, at least there's one case in the slides that I've sent you, a patient that is an MDR1 deficient patient that was receiving multiple drugs that were substrates for P-glycoprotein and the drug concentrations that we saw in those patients were really high. So that's another population that we need to examine. How can we use this tool to help us proactively protect those patients? And so again, all these patients here are examples of the different species that we've been able to provide monitoring for um, as those facilities have reached out to ask us questions. Antibiotics, immune modulatory, and anti-seizure meds are all part of the classes of drugs that we have monitored in these patients. Um, so some of my, this is where I'd like to see us go. And, and Tom and I have talked about this a little bit. Um, I think the other time that we need to be thinking about using monitoring is when we're using generics and or compounded products. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip to the next slide and show you what I think is the problem. And that is in veterinary medicine, looking at our anti-seizure meds and our immune modulatory meds, we tend to um, use um, human generics. And um, I probably need to go forward and then come back. So I'm a little bit, yeah, I'm going to come back to that concept here in just a couple minutes. Oh, so still talking about what drugs we should be using monitoring for. 
presumably drugs that have a steep dose response curve. And while that clearly is a category of drugs for which monitoring can be most useful when just a mild twitch in the dose causes a marked difference in response, I don't think we need to limit it to those class of drugs. Certainly serious toxicity is another example, a narrow therapeutic range. This is where digoxin monitoring became so important. Um, altered disposition. And I think actually we do some monitoring here, which is helpful. And the example I'm going to use is zanisamide, which I think becomes saturated in dogs because they don't acetylate well. And then phenobarbital in cats. I think that they saturate relatively easily. And while that may not be a need for monitoring, although I think it does, is a reason for monitoring these species. It also complicates how we interpret that monitoring if we've reached the saturation and the response between dose and concentration suddenly changes because of that saturation. And then presumably drugs that are really expensive, we might want to monitor. And kind of an example of that is cyclosporin and veterinarians that put their patients on ketoconazole to try and decrease the costs of cyclosporin. Monitoring can be used to assess whether or not that really made a difference in the cyclosporin concentrations. And I actually have a couple of cases of that in um, the slides that we probably won't get to. Okay, so just as a reminder, if we talk about the WENs, and we'll talk a little bit more clearly about the WENs here in just a couple of minutes, the other thing we need to remind ourselves is that monitoring is only as good as the availability of an assay, and the assay has to be a good assay. So it has to be rapid, um, otherwise we can't get the data back to our uh, clients in a, a timely fashion. Presumably automated uh, assays are more efficient and therefore more timely, and that certainly has proven to be true in our lab, but we have had to set up now days that we did HPLCs. We dedicated um, that day to HPLC, but we can only um, do that once every one to two weeks, and so the turnaround time is indeed impacted. Of course, of course, it has to be a reasonable cost to our clients. Um, and I have to be careful here because our clients are the veterinarians that use the lab, but our clients, of course, are also the pet owners of the patients. And if we charge an assay um, at $50 and we understand that the veterinarian doubles that and we're asking for peaks and troughs, um, then it becomes relatively costly. And so I do focus on, do we really need this monitoring? And if we do, do we need a peak and trough? And we'll highlight some of those um, issues here uh, in a little bit. Um, so we've already mentioned that this does need to be applicable to the patient in the sense that there does have to be a correlation between the drug concentration and the response. And that, of course, is going to be problematic, especially if we have a drug whose mechanism of action is not dependent upon drug concentrations, but let's say, for example, causes an irreversible effect. And so really the drug doesn't need to stick around anymore. Or we'll talk about metabolites here in just a couple of minutes. So there are drugs for which monitoring isn't useful in part based upon what is causing the effect and how does it cause that effect. Now, we also talk about a therapeutic range. A therapeutic range must be available, but notice my question mark because I don't necessarily agree with that. That's the traditional idea that we have to have a therapeutic range. I think we need to have a target, but I think we need to be careful applying that to our individual patient. And then I do above all else think that there needs to be a qualified individual for interpretation. I do get real frustrated sometimes when I see internists talking about monitoring and when it should and should not be used without the support of a clinical pharmacologist, because sometimes they don't think about the things that they, I think that they need to think about. Since I'm both an internist and a clinical pharmacologist, I can get away with that. And a number of us are going to be in that boat as well. Um, and Tom is a neurologist. So I, I do think it needs to be somebody that really knows the idea of genetics and how it impacts what we're trying to do for our patient. So just a couple of points about the assay. Um, so the assay has to target, the, uh, the assay has to not just detect, but it has to 
accurately quantify the target molecule. And this is where we get in a little bit of trouble because of course the target molecule may be an active metabolite. And so some of our assays that are automated and the example I'm showing here is a benzodiazepine, don't just target the diazepam, but they actually target the active metabolites. Chlorazepate might be the example, nor diazepam. Now that can become a problem. And another example here is cyclosporin. And I think uh, this is for cyclosporin. You know, cyclosporin, I think has, uh, Clara, you might know this better, like 20 metabolites. And not many of them are very active. And so if your assay targets all of these metabolites because it's based upon an antibody that doesn't discriminate between the parent and the metabolite, then you've got a problem. And while you might have a therapeutic reference interval, that variability in those metabolites is going to be manifested in our patients as well. And so it just makes it a little bit less accurate assay. Having said that, however, I don't think we should slam assays that are based upon antibodies versus assays that are only based upon the parent compound, such as you might get with HPLC, because we do understand that some of these metabolites are active and we want to be able to capture that. So as we're thinking about therapeutic drug monitoring and what is the target molecule, we need to step back and ask what is causing the effect in the patient. So it does have to be sensitive, and that's a problem sometimes because especially when we look at pharmacokinetic studies and we see the plasma drug concentration versus time curves, and we see that the majority of the time is fed at concentrations that are above what is going to cause the therapeutic effect, the problem with that is if our assay is not sensitive enough to be able to detect concentrations that are lower that are associated with the therapeutic response, then that assay is not going to do us any good at all. So our assay has to be sensitive enough to pick up concentrations that are associated with response, and not all of them are. And that's one of the reasons why when you're reviewing a, a paper, you look at the um, limits of quantitation of the paper, and you need to to make sure that those limits of quantitation are well below the therapeutic range so that we've captured that full time course. And then of course, here's the biggie. Uh, it has to be precise. It has to be re repeatable. Um, and that has to be demonstrated by the laboratory. And that's easy for automated assays, which have an internal uh, quality assurance program, but it's much more difficult for HPLC assays where it's incumbent upon the laboratory to keep that data current and that data read, readily available for their users. So the, in this case, the veterinary clients. And then, of course, it's got to be validated for the target species. And so what we do in dogs is not going to be necessarily valid for cats. And that becomes a real problem when we're doing a beluga whale or a flying fox for the first time. And one of the things that we've done to address that is we've asked the facility that's sending us this unique species, if they can send us some control serum from an animal that's not being treated. I mean, usually they have that in the refrigerator or freezer, and then we just use that. We'll divide it up and make three controls and spike the um, standard with that and get a feel for whether or not we've got some credibility. Uh, we're able to predict that concentration in that spiked sample, it gives us a level of confidence for the actual concentration of the unknown that we're measuring. And while it's not as valid as we would like, at least it has been useful for us to help guide um, many of these zoos when they're dealing with drugs that they really don't know they don't have much support for designing dose and regimen. And we do have to worry about interfering compounds. And so this is just from our cyclosporin assay. We do use an automated assay and it's showing you um, all of the data that's been generated by the um, maker of the reagents demonstrating that they've dem uh, demonstrated that they know and they're showing us that they don't have strange drugs interfering with the assay. And that's of course the advantage of using a anti antibody, monoclonal antibody-based assay, you're less likely to see interference from these other drugs. 
But then, of course, the problem is you're likely to see interference from metabolites. And so you just have to be able to answer that. The other issue is sometimes we just don't know what we don't know. And the example here is levetiracetam. Um, we do use uh, a automated assay for levetiracetam. But when we were trying to set up a uh, HPLC assay for a research study, we were having so much trouble with accuracy and precision of our standard curve, our calibration curve. It was wacko as far as being able to predict our concentrations. And it turned out that levetiracetam is actually metabolized in the plasma. We did not know that at the time. And so our neat little stock solution in plasma was quietly metabolizing away our levetiracetam. And it took us a couple of weeks and a lot of frustration to figure that out. So these are the things that we need to think about when we're establishing an assay. The other thing is, where is the drug? And so one of the things that we've learned with cyclosporin, and I won't go through this whole slide, but the most important thing is that most of it, or a lot of it's in the red blood cell. So the assay, our auto automated assay is based upon red blood cells. And that becomes, that's great. Um, and that's why we have uh, uh, the whole blood submitted for our assays. But just to show you some of the problems, uh, we like to use the assay for research as well. And we had a study where we were looking at the release of cyclosporin in saline, a release from the tap of uh, the capsules in saline as an indication of dissolution. And we cannot fool the instrument into thinking that the vehicle that the cyclosporin was in was blood. And so it simply wouldn't run the assay because the instrument is much smarter than us and it knows when it's dealing with blood versus not. So my point of this slide is, again, you do have to back up and make sure that you are assaying the correct sample or the correct tissue. The other part of this, of course, is if you do change to a different tissue, then you have to revalidate your assay for that tissue, even if it's the same target species. So you can't make assumptions that it will be the same. So let me go forward here. Um, so still talking about some pitfalls of monitoring, other things that you need to figure out. So we found out many years ago that serum separator tubes, um, the, um, oh, and I'm sorry, are you guys seeing the, oh, I didn't go back to, let me fix this, my apologies. One of the things that we um, figured out is that the silicon gel, gel which is uh, lipid, and it's designed to uh, uh, separate the clot from the serum, because it is lipid, it actually binds to lipid drugs as well. And so if the client is using a serum separator tube to separate the serum and clot, while it's very convenient, um, it may artificially decrease the concentration in the serum. And so we did a little study many years ago demonstrating that's an issue with phenobarbital. The newer serum separator tubes don't do that as much, but we still warn the clients to harvest the plasma, is, uh, the, I'm sorry, the serum as soon as you can. And there are other things as well. Every time you do a new assay, you develop a new assay, you have to step back and ask the question, does it bind to glass? Does it bind to plastic? What else is going to impact that, um, that chemical artificially? Freezing, does that impact it? Cyclosporin, do the clients have to send this on a freeze pack? And we've demonstrated that, no, you don't have to send cyclosporin cold, but that took a separate study to demonstrate that that condition did not need to be met. So as you think about monitoring, you need to step back and make sure that however the sample is being collected, however the sample is being handled from the time that it's collected to the time that it's analyzed also has to be demonstrated to be okay for that analyte. Some other things, patient needs to be at steady state. We'll talk about that in just a couple minutes. When do we take the sample versus um, in, in, the, in the context of the dose? Do we really need a peak and trough? And then this idea of therapeutic range and putting it in the context, oh, you're within the therapeutic range, so you're good to go. Mm, I don't think that that's a good way to talk about therapeutic ranges. 